Hi, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to have a conversation with my uh, dear friend, Felicia Marcus, and colleague, actually, at this point, uh, who is, has joined us as a William Lander Visiting Fellow at Stanford uh, at Water in the West program. Uh, Felicia, and also Felicia is also a um, founder of the Water Policy Group, which is a group of uh, water policy experts who work on various water issues across the world. Um, Felicia, before joining us, she used to be the chair of the Water uh, Resources Control Board and, uh, um, uh, and uh, worked on various issues. Uh, one of the most important, two, two highlights of that time for me personally is the work that she did on Sigma and also uh, water conservation efficiency programs during the severe drought that we had in California. Before joining the water board, uh, uh, being appointed to the water board, Felicia uh, was the administ uh, regional administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency's Pacific Southwest region during the climate and uh, Clinton administration. And, um, uh, and before that, she served as a president of the board of the public works for the city of Los Angeles. She has been holding a lot of different important and positions throughout her uh, life. And I am truly honored and pleased to have her here. Um, Felicia, it's uh, good to have you. It's great to be here. So um, actually, before we start, I just want to highlight why, uh, why we are here and uh, sort of like the, uh, the, the program that initiated this conversation. Uh, this is part of the uh, efforts with uh, collaboration with the Pacific Council and the Global Washington that has partnered with uh, seven cities across the US to identify new strategies and collaborations to, act, uh, to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030. Um, the Pacific Council is uh, focusing on two goals as part of this process. One is uh, SDG six, which focuses on clean water and sanitation and 16, which is peace, justice and strong institutions um, and uh, representing Los Angeles as uh, one of those cities uh, among the seven cities. I know uh, there is a link in the chat. If you would like to learn more about this, please um, uh, go ahead and um, uh, explore more. Um, and before further ado, I, um, I would like to have this start this conversation with you, I guess, maybe let's start with the discussion around sustainability and resiliency. Uh, you know, we kind of move from buzzword to buzzword, sometimes with a limited sort of uh, uh, understanding of what each one of them mean and uh, where we want to, how do you measure them and where we want to go. And for, uh, for a sort of a, a, a maven in the sector and somebody who has worked on water issues for such a long time, I like to kind of uh, hear your perspective on sustainability. We have been uh, using sustainability as a buzzword for almost about 40 years. I was actually mm -hmm. uh, checking that yesterday to make sure I have a number right. And, um, and uh, I like to hear what your perspective is on, you know, how, where we are and where we're going on Sustain, achieving sustainable water resource management. Well, great, thanks. I, you know, the first thing I would say is that it's an honor to be here with the Pacific Council and it's a special honor and a, a bit humbling to have uh, Nusha Ajami ask me the questions because she is such an expert. And in addition to being colleagues at Stanford, now we were colleagues in the water board family as she's on the regional board for San Francisco and one of the real state leaders in water quality um, rationality, uh, implementation and um, discussion. So I hope this will be more of a conversation. Um, a couple of thoughts in response to your question and we can talk about some of it a little more. You know, having now been around for those four decades, um, including being at the early stage of the sustainability movement where first we were tree huggers and people made fun of that. And then sustainability became a word that people made fun of and um, and now it's a word that's sort of in common parlance and in the production world, we think of it as circular economy and all that, which is uh, a notion of efficiency and not wasting resources. I can see the, the, the uh, progress we've made in that context. Mm -hmm. I think our bigger challenge in the coming, uh, in the months to come uh, really stem from uh, the challenge of resilience, which is a different Thing, and you've spoken eloquently about this, but just in short, for folks who, have it, who think those words are uh, 
uh, you know, in Roger's thesaurus together, they're, they're really not. And I'm, I'm not going to go all Miriam Webster on everyone, but resilience implies the need to deal with disruption mm -hmm. and surprise and things outside the norm, as well as his ability to recover from those things that we know will happen. And I think that's really the, the challenge or the precipice we're at now. We still have a ways to go in, in terms of sustainability, which I have a couple thoughts on to start the discussion, but we really now, eyes wide open, have to think about resilience because climate change is gonna throw us curveballs where the past is definitely not a roadmap to the future. And even without climate change, we know, for example, if you're thinking water resources in a state like California, let alone the world, we're gonna lose our snowpack with a few degrees temperature rise. It, that's gonna mean more flooding in the springtime more often and more frequent and longer droughts. I mean, drought has gotten a lot of the headlines over the past you know, five, six years because of the big one we just went through, but floods call, cause death and property damage. And when they happen, they are uh, really a much bigger deal. They're not a slow moving disaster. They are like an earthquake um, disaster, except they don't end in a minute. Um, and so, uh, we're going to need to figure out how to change all of our uh, planning systems, not just to be bigger, which would be, you know, an engineering, an old style engineering response, but a new style engineering response, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit in terms of integrating green infrastructure and more resilient infrastructure across a wider set of scenarios. So we're, we've made a lot of progress, but we're at a, a challenging time. I would say in water where we've made the most project progress domestically is in water quality in particular, um, just because we've just um, the past 30 years have seen, you know, regulation from the EPA, regulation from the states, particularly California, but also a very heightened public awareness. And in some cases, a public awareness that goes beyond the rational risk level so that, uh, it, you know, it's uh, when you think about drinking water, all the people that buy bottled water when their tap water is perfectly good and cheaper and their bottled water is not regulated mm -hmm. as much. So, so in some ways that heightened public awareness has driven a lot as well as uh, regulation. And we made a lot of progress there except for disadvantaged communities. And that's where our SDG six conversation will come in because we're by no means um, the cutting edge at a worldwide level, although we're, you know, much better situated than most parts of the world. I would say we've also made a lot of progress in conservation and efficiency, particularly in California, but across the West since earlier, less severe droughts than the one we had just a few years ago. We're starting to take off on recycling and stormwater capture in, it's like on speed in Southern California and starting to get traction in other places. Um, even on the west, on the east coast, which people in the west coast might be surprised, at, and we can talk about it. And I'd say we've we've made periodic progress over time in managing special places, whether it's Bay Delta through the Bay Delta Accords of the '90s and a little bitty um, uh, things we were able to do in the Brown administration, although sadly not enough. Colorado River agreements, Everglades, Great Lakes, periodically when we get a focus where we're kind of all in at the federal, state, and local level, we've made progress on these special places, including, you know, small lakes and streams that communities are daylighting uh, all over the place. So we've, we've made progress, but we haven't taken it um, to the level we need to, to truly be sustainable or truly be resilient. So you could look at that as a problem. You could also look at it as an opportunity. Um, there's more, but I'll, I'll stop there. I actually want to go back to your comment with resilience. I thought that was very, um, uh, such an important uh, distinction between sustainability and resilience, and especially the role of climate change in sort of differentiating between the two. And um, I guess sort of like a question, or a, I would like to sort of hear your perspective on this. You know, obviously, you know, we have come to realize more and more what the central role climate change is playing in a way in our, uh, in availability and quality of water supplies, right? And the way it's sort of disrupted our um, uh, water cycle. Uh, but, you know, I'm wondering, do you think um, the progress that we have made in sustainability 
um, you know, how that can be sort of used in a way to make us more resilient. I'm trying to sort of like better sort of, I'm trying to sort of see if we can better connect these two in a sense that, you know, all that from three huggers to today's Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, uh, you know, that whole movement, uh, sort of how we can we sort of plug in resiliency somewhere in between, or are we done with sustainability can, and just, can we just switch to resilience? Oh, thank you. I mean, that is such a good question. And I, it particularly, it's really helpful in how I think about it. It's definitely not an either or, it is a both and. And I think the sustainability work and the progress we have made lays a great foundation for dealing with resilience. So we're not, we're not at the, the stage of the conversation about the environment, which, you know, not that long ago, I, I'll say 20 and 30 years, not just 30 years ago. And in some pockets, even at the national level recently, it, it's ended up being a conversation of um, either or, is so, is not. I always talk about how the level of discourse for so many years was, is so, is, is not, you're a jerk, no, I'm not, which was just wasting a lot of time. I think now we have a much greater appreciation for the environment it, it, throughout everything. And so I won't say we've won, we've won the foundational conversation about this not being a boutique issue, but being a core issue, not just in reality, but in politics, which is a different reality. And um, it politics lags, I think sometimes human, uh, what, what regular people actually care about, unfortunately. And that's a, 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 another conversation. So I do think that we've got this great basic um, recognition of the importance that we just need to build on in order to think about resilience. I think the heightened awareness in each poll just makes me, you know, horrified it's taken so long, but happy it's happening. You know, the public, regardless of party, sees climate change as a massive problem. Mm -hmm. And that's largely because they've seen the disruptive effects, whether it's from hurricanes and storms or flooding or droughts, but it that's come to them from lived experience or seen experience and I think that's exactly the um, extra motivation one needs. Sustainability is let's live within our means, you know, let's be good to the earth. I, I think most people want to conserve. I mean, having been in public works during the recycling era where you might say solid waste recycling and saving our landfill space is hardly as expensive, as important as water or air, but it led first. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because, and I used to say this in LA, that people wanted to be a part of doing something good for the environment. And, and at that early stage, people make fun of my little yellow bins. Well, those little yellow bins have become giant blue bins. And, mm -hmm. and at least I knew and we knew <laughs> in the environmental community and uh, the city family that the public really wanted not to waste stuff. I mean, it's kind of a value which the the norms that press the political system, some in the corporate, well, not all in the corporate world are about production and um, and waste as a actually a, a good thing. So I think we've Consumption. overcome. Yes, yeah, so and we've overcome that to a certain um, extent. So that lays a good foundation. But the resilience argument, I think is not gonna be as hard to get into the basic body politic just because we've actually seen you know, we've taken so long to deal with climate that we are actually seeing the impacts of not mitigating. But again, I think the adaptation that we're going to need to make is not only overdue and important in terms of saving property and lives and the environment, um, it's also going to drive much more of a demand for mitigation um, of climate. So I, you know, I tend to be a glass half full person. I think we're at a moment where um, we can figure out how to rebuild our infrastructure using green infrastructure where we're getting not just one problem solved but multiple mm -hmm. problem solves and greening our urban community. I'm just seeing that take off, uh, not just in California, but all over the world. So I, I think we're actually at a hopeful place. It's just a little bit later than we might have liked. But again, yeah. it, it builds on the sustainability efforts that so many people have labored on. And frankly, the corporate world has uh, really led on parts of the corporate world. And I think what one thing I, uh, I wanted to sort of follow on to your comment with adaptation and mitigation uh, and your early efforts around recycling, I think I was wondering how do you sort of connect that with today's issues around 
um, sort of decarbonization and all the movement around climate change, which um, to my disappointment often leaves water behind. And I, you always feel like, why can't we just talk about water more? Or are we really seriously thinking that is this decarbonization effort is going to have, you know, what are the environmental footprints of that? Are we really sort of thinking about water? I would like to see what your um, perspective is on that. Um, I know this is like a little off the topic of conversation we started, but I think it sort of does relate to sustainability and resilience in a, such an important way. And I would love to hear your perspective on that, on that issue. Uh, yeah, I, that's one, I have a bee in my bonnet about that one. I, I actually think that, you know, there are many reasons, but there are sort of three threads, if I can remember all three of them um, as we discuss it. One is I think uh, you have the institutional structural issues that are different in water than they are in energy. Sure. For example, where you, in order to keep the electrons flowing, it's just a law of physics, we have until more recently, you still need physics, but we have until recently relied on very large um, institutional investor owned utilities to do that massive infrastructure of transmission generation and getting it into people's homes that has been regulated at a bigger level. It needs to be, you know, we've got the Western grid that covers the whole Western part of the country. It's, right. it's a miracle. It's an even bigger miracle than water <laughs> in some ways that it works and even less appreciated and understood um, much in the sense that, you know, people assume water just comes out the tap and the light comes on when you flip the switch. And they, the fact that they don't have to think about that is a miracle of modern social, economic and political development that we should feel um, good about. On the other hand, because you've had a few heavily regulated entities, you've been able to apply public policy pressure points, both having government lovers, but also having um, the environmental community and foundations figure out how to um, use regulations to get more investment in, um, without getting into too much in the weeds in conservation and renewables. Whereas in water, we've got thousands, I think it was 50,000 was the number we heard this morning of, um, earlier this morning on how many water utilities there are. There are thousands just in California and they tend not to be regulated for much other than water quality. Um, you know, it's only 17% of the state in California are regulated by the PUC. The public ones are regulated for quality, but are not regulated for how they run their business beyond that. Uh, except for you know, during the emergency and the drought and some planning rules. So it's just very fragmented. And so it's been harder to get a hold of both for government or for the environmental community um, against that same underlying floor where people take it for granted because we have actually done a good job getting it to um, so many places. I, I do, um, and there's third place, which is I, I do take a little bit Umbridge isn't really the right world word, it's not my place, but I do think within the climate change driving world of advocacy and foundations, there's still a preference for mitigation and emitting yes, less stuff. Sure. Yes. There's sophistication <laughs> about pushing renewables as an alternative hard, which is where we're getting the most success versus a pure regulatory. Right. Um, driver, but they still uh, view water as a boutique issue mm -hmm. and adaptation as not the main thing event, and which is something I really disagree with I because agree. I think water is the bleeding edge of adaptation and where the pain point's going to be on some, whether it's floods or droughts Absolutely. or disruption. I also think people can relate to water more. And so as we do those things we need to do to adapt, water is going to get more public attention than energy, which is kind of wonky, and will ultimately drive more political will. That's the old organizer in me talking to, as well as the <laughs> let's hope, let's hope, observer. let's hope. I, I yeah. like that vision. I like that. I like how you're sort of taking this. Um, let me uh, sort of go back to you touched on a few things on green infrastructure and um, and uh, and just general topic of resilience. Um, you know, we talk about renewables and how sort of energy sector has changed over time. I want to see what uh, 
what your perspective is on that when it comes to water, like, and how we are transitioning. Are we really taking along with us the institutions that we have as well as we are transitioning since, you know, you and I both, uh, you know, obviously the state board and then for me in regional board is always like very interesting to see that, you know, change is happening and we sort of constantly have to adapt to what, what needs to be done. And I, um, I like to know what your perspective is and like how, what's that role? And, um, and also generally speaking, how are we sort of going, incorporating these distributed solutions um, within our existing system that we have? Well, I think the, the drivers in water, uh, the effective drivers and leadership are a little bit different depending on the issue one talks about. I really see, you have leadership on energy here too, but I, and on climate in general, I think it's local government that makes the difference in local politics where the, again, the people are ahead of most politicians, but they're closer to local leadership. So I see the, the drivers in climate and when you think about um, C40, the organization that um, Mayor Eric Godsetti of LA is currently the chair of, um, founded uh, with um, Mike Bloomberg of New York originally, where they've been driving the notion of climate adaptation, climate change, climate action for decades throughout the ebb and flow that we've seen at the state and federal level. I also think on water, local governments have a particular leadership ability because they can see the quality of life mm -hmm. benefit of using less water, particularly in a place like Southern California where you're so many hundreds of miles away from your sources of water, but also where you can envision as they did in LA with uh, Proposition O at the city level and now Measure W at the countywide level an ability to integrate not just recycling, but stormwater capture with urban greening so that it becomes a more livable future. That gives me hope. You know, Singapore has done that. The pictures of modern Singapore just are incredible for any of us who were last there 40 years ago. But it's it's amazing and it's happening all over the um, world driven at the local level and hopefully with federal and state players figuring out how to be on the assist versus having to be the driver all the time. So I think, um, I think there's a slightly different you know, motivation. When you start thinking about SDG 6 too, in terms of water and sanitation basic needs, um, that one in many ways you do need a, a, a state or national driver in some ways because of the economics, but that you have localities doing some really innovative things um, like uh, Ethekwini in, um, in South Africa and a number of other places where they're, they're thinking about developing their sanitation systems in a way that doesn't use as much water, for example, and that mm -hmm. generates jobs. You think about in India, the amazing anti-defecation uh, movement right. where uh, you really, it, 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 on the basic health and sanitation, I think there is an appropriate role as a driver, a funder for the, um, the state and uh, national authorities because leaving these fragmented uh, small and sometimes slightly larger right. communities to their own devices, they just don't have the means to, to do it. On the other hand, when they do something innovative like Ita Queenie, it's in, which is right outside Durban, part of Durban, it's important um, to support them, which is what the national government, while being skeptical at first, is now promoting it across the nation and internationally. I think that's actually, you brought up a very important point, which uh, might worth sort of exploring a little bit more, which is the difference between our existing sort of fragmented rigid system that we are sort of trying to innovate within it versus uh, some of the developing world or underdeveloped world that has an opportunity to actually look very different from what you have you look like. And um, their opportunities are very different. They're, you know, they sort of have an opportunity to leapfrog and, yeah. and not do what we have done and actually be the leader of the next uh, world and next generation of um, our next model that we are hoping to achieve. And, uh, you know, in your international work that you're doing, do you see some of that sort of being embraced or, or do you think we are still sort of uh, exporting our um, antiquated system wherever we can, <laughs> you know, just, just as a natural process? <laughs> well, it's an interesting question. I, would, I have sort of two answers that may seem to conflict. Um, one is 
we don't have anywhere near enough interest in the developing world and helping them. Certainly in the in the more recent, but business in general. I mean, uh, the U.S. is, I won't say myopic, but more inwardly focused. So if you're internationally, people talk about the SDGs. Domestically, not so much. I mean, we may be talking more now about uh, drinking water in disadvantaged communities in places like Minnesota and um, California because those states have we've raised the issue to try right. and get that sure. um, awareness. The same problem exists in other states. They're just not highlighting it uh, to solve it. Um, uh, you know, whether you're in Texas or you know uh, Iowa or anywhere, you've got if you've had irrigated ag, you have the externality of a socially productive process of farming that has contaminated groundwater. And so you got to figure out sure. what to do with what it. Do. And, you know, a lot of farmers do drink bottled water because they know that's the issue. It's just their farm workers can't always afford it and they don't always supply it to them. So, you know, there's right. an issue of, of that, but we don't talk about it in terms of the sustainable de development goals. And we don't seem to talk about it. This is one of the things in the water policy group we've talked about that has surprised um, the members that aren't from the US because in general, the discussion about the UN and, and uh, the world as a whole and all the SDGs, not just SDG six is a much more common conversation, which is we don't have it here so much. In fact, it, we have it more in the corporate world because in the corporate sure. sustainability world where people uh, operate in the international sphere, they sure. speak SDG, whereas <laughs> sure. here- we They're present don't. everywhere, yes. Right, and so we're not out there helping that much. I mean, you've got- sure. You've got uh, American institutions, certainly, that are helping. You've got, uh, for whether you like it or not, you've got the, the Gates Foundation work on reinventing the toilet, and particularly looking at one that you're not plumbing, wasting a ton of water with, sure. which is an important um, advance. And you have, you know, all kinds of NGOs, whether WaterAid or Water.org or, you know, uh, Pacific Institute. I mean, take your, your pick of institutions that are working um, you know, internationally on this issue that are based uh, in the U.S. or based in the U.K. and have chapters in the in the U.S. But in general, it's not as much a part of what we as a nation um, think about. And it's a place where we can potentially learn, you know, from elsewhere, both in terms of more localized treatment and how to make it work, uh, as well as uh, water uh, sanitation systems that don't need as much water. I mean, we've certainly done better on low flow toilets than we used to because we have more of them now and they actually <laughs> work now as opposed right. to the early years. But, um, and, and I think there's an opportunity with uh, both the uh, incredible technological advance in sensors and big data to be able to figure out how to deal with leaks uh, in a more right. targeted way. And leaks are where most systems really lose uh, massive proportions of their water um which right. is a shame you know you can treat it well absolutely. but you still have to get it to someone's home absolutely after all the resources that spend on them from yeah. money to energy to everything else um i actually want to ask you a few questions regarding like it was raised by the audience and i think it would be good to sort of touch on them one was like a general question about the comment you made about people and communities are daylighting sm small streams Mm -hmm. um, and I think somebody wanted to know what does what does that mean, and if you can elaborate on that a little bit more. Oh no, I'd I'd love to. I mean, there is a whole urban streams movement um, that's been around for a couple of decades. This is um, going back even before my work with the Trust for Public Lands. You know, you have these miracles happening all over the country, where you know a lot of times there's a great school in Oakland, uh, Bella Vista, where we the community the kids actually mapped where there were underground streams under their school and painted it, you know, across the playground. They didn't daylight <laughs> that one, but, nice. but all through our urban areas, there are, I don't want to say vestigial streams because they're still there. And we've got, we've got all kinds of water pumps that are pumping out basements and foundations. People don't realize this all over the place. I mean, even LA has done an assessment of some of this in terms of what they can capture right. to add to their water, mm -hmm. um, their water system, which is really remarkable. And so, but, but quite apart from the notion of it being a water source, you do have all kinds of areas where folks are taking out um, places where streams have been covered over and have to be pumped, opening them back up to make an urban area more 
livable. You know, there's right. the the sort of the San Antonio River Rock model where you're getting, you know, um, restaurants and businesses and a walk or like along the Erie, the whatever, not the Erie Canal, whatever that canal is in uh, Georgetown in in DC. And you have this happening all over the country, but you also have a whole movement to to daylight. Um, stream so long as they're not you know right under a building now or under a uh right. road in some places you can even move the road and it's it's this bringing nature back into right living setting nature. right yes. yeah and and i think that's that's such an important point and and i love that um that uh, river in dc i know exactly what you're talking about and georgetown behind that little canal that goes through yeah. which is really really cute and i don't know the name of it either um, I mean, I can't recall it. Um, and I think, I think that's actually touches on the earlier comment you made with green and gray infrastructure, right? Sort of trying to sort of work with nature rather than uh, sort of conquering the nature and trying to sort of build our way through it. Um, I think uh, you mentioned water quality regulations um, and I'm, I'm assuming Clean Water Act was some of one that you sort of had in mind mm -hmm. as one of the major um, regulations we have had in the past 50 years related to water and has definitely helped us over the years to clean up our rivers, clean up our water bodies and, and, um, and uh, sort of make sure we have a, a cleaner environment. Um, but if, if you had a, you know, a, a sort of regulatory pen today or, you know, actually a legislative pen today and you could just, and you had the freedom of weaving it through the system quickly, what would be the, another regulation that you think it's important to have and we don't really have right now or we have to work towards? Well, this, uh, this may be a little wonky, um, but it, it, interestingly, the you know, the, the Clean Water Act was based on the state Porter Cologne Act in California. In fact, the <laughs> staff drafter of that, Ron Roby, went and helped them uh, write it. And it, 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 and the state, our state rules are more expansive. They're, you know, yes. they're better because we can get at more sources of contamination than the feds. We're not to say we're better in general. We're just better because some things are appropriately dealt with at the local level you know we have more ability to deal with we have our own problems but we have more ability to deal with um, agriculture and non-point source pollution than the federal government has but if i were going to change one thing it, it would actually be in in slightly a different um direction and that i think what we really need to do for resilience and for integrating quality of life and community. So the people are spending money, not just to meet a rule that somebody bequeaths from on high, but they're spending money to improve their community while they're doing it, is that we need a little more, either a push or a leeway to be able to do what I think of as strategic regulation, which is not sure. to be a hallmark card and all hold hands and be a happy face, but a little more flexibility to be able to say, community, if you deal with your multiple water issues, uh, drinking water, uh, stormwater quality, uh, flood control, et cetera, by doing urban greening and nature-based solutions, will either get you more time or get you more money uh, or whatever versus seeing them separately. I mean, I think you, you know what we did with the urban stormwater um, permit for Los Angeles mm -hmm. from the state board and the regional board we just tuned it up a little bit from what the regional board did was to say, look, if you if you try to do this really hard stuff of working across um, uh, political jurisdictions and different uh, silos, of, you know, some people talk about um, uh, silos, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, flood control people and water supply people and Water quality, water quality people, people. Right. never just doing their own thing blindly. Right. Some, right. some folks call them silos of excellence, um, <laughs> but they don't, it, it's spending money three times versus dealing with the drop of water all along the sure. water course where you spend a lot of money on concrete, but not actually, and uh, equipment and not actually have a livable community. You know, how do, how do we give help? And so in, in the permit we gave, uh, essentially I'm oversimplifying more time to those parts of the community that wanted to do this multiple benefit, we call multiple mm -hmm. benefit work for the betterment because we knew it would take more time. Right. And the, and the measure passed, you know, which was amazing because we had 
you know, there'll be 300 million a year in LA to do these integrated projects. So watch LA, you're gonna see over the next decade, a real transformation mm -hmm. on the ground all for the better. I would like it to be easier to do that than it is, right. but also without being naive and having enough um, backstops to make sure people can't just tell you a good story and you know, kind of get, right. a, get out of jail free card. Um, and so I think that's, that's what I would most like. I would most like all levels of government focus on helping the early adopters make this transformation, which is going to be important for our resilience to climate change, and then use the traditional single focused enforcement tools against the people who aren't even trying or aren't even, you know, making right. that distinction versus casting everybody with the same brush. And, and I think some of that is attitude, but some of it is just the architecture of the of the um, of the statutes, which don't have this consciousness of having a, a dual path. You know, you've got the folks who are trying to do the right thing, and you want to keep them honest, but you want to help them. And then you have the traditional laggards, which in the beginning was everybody, and now is a smaller part of the universe. Sort of. That's um, a wonky answer. Sorry. That's no. I think that's a perfect answer because it sort of com uh, highlights the fact that uh, not uh, not every solution fits all. Sort of like you have to sort of have that flexibility in a local way to um, maybe have a. I remember when I worked for the legislature, this whole concept of skeleton. The job of the legislature is provide a skeleton, and then people can put the meat in it. Uh, so that, uh, that's actually very good. My <laughs> colleague, Tony Slatyer in the water policy group, he has a, a, a paper out that he talks about it as policy scaffolding. Yes. Same idea. Same, Same idea. idea. Yes, exactly. And I think this, this is very important because it creates more flexibility and opportunity for innovation. But I think one, uh, maybe a challenge, but an opportunity there is also the fact that we are, we, we, the, the field sometimes is so dominated by engineers and, you know, I am an engineer and the, and I know how it's all about sort of knowing the answer, right? You solve the equation, get to an answer. And I think when you're dealing with nature, it's not as simple. You are dealing with a lot of uncertainty, sort of trial and error. You hope to get this answer, but it might not work. So to your point, time becomes an issue, right? So you have to sort of test different things and see how it's gonna work, where it's gonna work. So sort of, um, so I think that's a very actually important um, point that you brought up, which is sort of this adapt adaptive um, opportunity to give uh, some directive, but allow people to sort of find their own opportunities and innovate from within. Yeah, we really have to give the sort of extra credit points for really valuing multi-benefit approaches is sort of the Pacific Institute has its multi-benefit right. calculator to try and help communities do that. And you also, we also need to give, and this is the TPL person talking, you know, real points for livability and green space that Absolutely. can be left behind in the traditional engineering focus or control a need to because you want to have it, you want to know what's going to work. Getting to exactly. your, your point, but I think I think there's some really great examples of where the more natural approaches, whether it's sewage lagoons if you have the space, or uh, using floodplains for both flood mm -hmm. control and ecosystem protection, can make a difference. And you see the Central Valley Flood Board endorsing that. You see all of these experiments in the in um, the rice fields, you can look to the Netherlands, which is the, you know, we think of the Netherlands as the kings and queens of building dikes and keeping flood at bay through gray concrete. They're also doing really right. innovative stuff through doing floodplain setbacks where they've actually bought out parts of the urban world. The, the river wall, W-A-A-L is one of their great examples to let the river be the river. Right, and they get multiple benefits. So they, the Netherlands is not a bad place to look, even if you're the wonkiest engineer in the world for sure. things that can work and and you know make people love you more too. Right, and also sort of connects people to their water and water mm -hmm. to people, sort of like valuing that resource that they depend on. Uh, there's another question which I think is very important uh, for the situation we're all in right now, which is about, has the pandemic given more public attention to the need for clean water? 
that we have seen in the past, um, you know, the need to wash hands, keep material clean due to COVID-19. And maybe while you're talking about that, it would be, I would be um, very interested to hear your perspective on affordability and uh, the issues with um, moratoriums, if, if, um, if you would like to touch on that. Yeah, and I like you, I think you've done more quality thinking about that more recently than um, I have in the past two years. I think in general, the, the short answer is, oh yeah, for sure. And I think um, I think that's one of the silver linings. If you could have a silver lining in something this horrific, I mean, the drought did the same thing too. Ironically, the you know the 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 real pictures and stories about people running out of water during the drought raised and elevated the awareness of um, the vulnerability of small rural communities in California, anywhere else. You are in urban areas, in the media, the place where you got more voters and more politicians say, oh my God, how could that be? Far right. more so than the fact that those same communities have been drinking crappy water for decades, right? That's Absolutely. a harder one. To, so so, so the, the, the fact that people were out of water really struck a nerve in the public, which led to a lot more political will to get more tools to the water board to be able to help solve those problems problems and we can talk about that if you like where I think we're we're on the way finally um, to being able to make good on the human right to water goals of the 2012 uh, legislation and frankly the SDGs and the national uh, work on that the um, uh, the COVID it also gave a granular sense of you know if people don't have enough water they can't wash their hands the importance of that it, it has the, the folks who have gotten more media around, particularly the Navajo and other Indian tribes that don't have, that's been great. And just this week, you know, the Bureau of Reclamation commissioned a big water line that they built um, to help at Navajo, which is something that, you know, for 30 years, people have been bemoaning and, and um, you know, there's a challenge to deal with when you have such a large spread out reservation. So it's not, Absolutely. it's not a simple thing to get water to people that are that dispersed over such a long um, period. But anything that highlights these issues in the media are opportunities to be taken because the public responds well. Again, getting back to Absolutely. that earlier space. On affordability, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on it. I think um, there's a funny duality to it. We've always had the problem of um, poor rural communities without enough money who are drinking crappy water if they have it at all and also buying bottled water. You've got communities that don't have enough of a tax base to even be able to run a facility, even if we build it for them at the state level. And so now we have a funding source to subsidize. There's that. And then you have the issue where, and it's just not a good or bad thing, and these things just are. You can always tell I'm a, an old wastewater person because you know you just deal with problems and there's always going to be another one and you just deal with it. Right. Which is that um, as we increasingly know more and can measure more at a smaller brain and find new contaminants or cont like PFAS, which has taken over in the last couple of years, but has been there for decades, um, and we start doing higher standards, that costs more money to treat. So in order to deal with modern treatment standards, we're going to end up having to have fewer agencies because you don't have an economy of scale. We don't need just big ones, but we need something right. between thousands and a, you know, a few um, so that you get the economy of scale that you need to run different treatment trains for different contaminants. Because there's not just one kind of treatment. As you know, there's right. multiple kinds of treatment you have to use for different um, problems. And even in urban communities with economy of scale, the bills are going up. Yep. And they're going up for water quality, which people want. They're also going up as people realize they need to retrofit to deal with climate change and spend money on recycling, you know, stormwater capture, which can have these multiple benefits we've already talked about. But whether you're going to desal if you don't have a groundwater basin or you're going to recycle water or stormwater capture um, and treatment, that takes money and energy. And so just adapting ourselves to climate change, let alone making sure we're cleaning up water, uh, it's, it costs more money. Now, is it, you know, it's money well spent, you know, if you compare it to the cost of those Starbucks lattes or whatever, or cell phones, it's not. Um, 
it is if you have a giant yard, you're trying to look like a Scottish golf link in the middle of August, but people are starting to transition out of, of those. So that hopefully. I think we, yeah, hopefully, we need to think about water bills in terms of basic uh, sanitation and sure. um, water supply and, and figure out ways to make it more affordable uh, through a, a number of fronts. But I think we really, as a society, need to just bite the bullet and help subsidize it for folks who really, for indoor use in particular, and some trees outside, um, not necessarily green carpets. But we need to, I think as a society, it's not asking too much for us to cross subsidize that. But Prop 218 makes it a little bit more difficult, but not impossible in California. So we need to, we need to work on both Prop 218, but also the messaging and the budgeting and the communication of local agencies in terms of trying to help make a distinction between what a basic amount of water, not a hair shirt amount, but a basic amount of water is and, and do tiered pricing, frankly. Sure. I mean, I guess um, as you were talking about Prop 218, I was thinking um, if I had, a, um, I had a power to uh, take water out of Prop 218, I would have done it tomorrow. <laughs> That's actually the best answer. That, that would have been the best and shortest answer to your first question. But seriously, because it's definitely, uh, it's a hinder for a lot of water agencies, especially the ones that are smaller and the medium-sized ones that don't have the technical and financial capacity to constantly do the accounting and know what, how things are happening. And I think one other thing you mentioned, which really strikes um, a chord with me, was the um, was the connection between. Um, so I was thinking, you know, people, um, it's hard to value something when you don't know what it takes to come to you, right? So if it's coming thousands and thousands of miles, or even if you don't even see the source and you don't see how it's changing over time it's very hard to value it versus when you really see something, you want to protect it, right? Just, just a simple thing of using the grass in your backyard, right? If it's, you know, if it's uh, yellowing, you want to give more water to protect it. So you should not have a grass, but I'm just trying to sort of no, that's bring that really to the point. concept of, you know, when you see something, you want to protect it. If you just really have no clue where it's coming from or what happens, it's very hard to value it very, very much. Um, I have a, another question for you, which is sort of like a clarifying question, which you mentioned about Durban, South Africa, and uh, somebody wanted to know if you can mention the initiative um, and what it was. Uh, I well, think that was the one with, um, um, with the sanitation model. Right, it's, yeah. they've done both, and I'm gonna, off the top of my head, I'm not gonna, re I should remember it because I've been working on it, but I, um, I can't remember the exact phrasing. What they they did is a tiered on the water side. They did sort of a tiered. Uh, it, it, they did sort of a here's the extent of it's a very large area. So here's mm. the extent of where we can easily pipe it into people's homes, and then they did another tier for where people were far away. But they didn't just do it by utility you know, getting central spigots to people, they did it by engaging the community as part of a, a sort of rural-ish economic mm -hmm. development where they organized communities to have folks who were like water bailiffs who would make sure that there was enough water at a central area for folks. Sometimes they do it through, uh, uh, and they even did this in Phoenix during their recent drought is sort of uh, pressure limit so that you can't use as much as you want because it's coming out slower, but you're gonna get right. enough to be able to deal with it. On the sanitation side, they similarly did something where they set up sort of these really interesting um, toilets where they harvest the, they don't use as much water, they harvest the solid waste and they dry and pelletize it for a pretty safe fuel, which has also created economic development in that uh, area with jobs for people. Um, so it's just interesting how they could combine the two right. when they also have a different economic regime. So like Chile and other places have a much stronger economic uh, regulation of water utilities where they are supposed to recover all their costs. Like cost recovery, neoliberalism, whatever you call it, is a really important driver, sure. as is human right to water. And so they were in this bind where getting 
water and sanitation in the same method to these outer burbs just wasn't financially viable. So you couldn't meet both of these driving national norms. And they experimented with coming up what worked for them, which now the central government is promoting. And I apologize for not, I can, I can follow up with people. I, there are names for each of these initiatives. I just can't draw them out of my mind right now. You know, and, and uh, it's just, it's just an interesting way to think about it. It has detractors and you know, there's a, I'm sorry, there's a quote I love from Yogi Berra that um, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. <laughs> so it's easy at the national or the state level to theorize about what a place ought to do. Right. But you've got to be grounded in the practical in order to get it done. Otherwise, you can end up in this weird situation where and this was true in drinking water in California until more recently and true. It's like you can be comfortable as a regulator at the state or federal level by spanking the local community as opposed to being there to try and help the them. partner. Right, yeah. right, right. Uh, was this uh, featured in the Brave Blue World uh, documentary? Do you know? If I can't remember if it is. I think uh -huh. there's some there's some interesting stuff in there um, and I haven't I saw an early version. I haven't seen the one that they sure. they just put out, but it, sure. it might be. I'm not sure. Let me ask you. Like we have we have only five minutes, and I want to ask you this: is a great question, which I would like to sort of um, have uh, have you have a chance to comment on. Somebody asked, "Do you see any examples of legal regimes and regulations that are good models for facilitating water resiliency, particularly across different countries?" Um, uh, you, you know, I would love to, you know, to hear your thoughts on that. Any, you know, based on your international experience, what have you seen that um, you think it's, it's worth paying attention to, learn from, or avoid maybe in yeah. some cases? Well, I think rationalizing some of our systems is important. I mean, I think, you know, I look to the Netherlands in this river wall, room for the river wall is a really good mm. example. And of course, you know, you have Israel and Singapore, which sort of lead the way on the technological front, um, in part because they both face existential threats. Um, so you can always learn from them. Uh, water management, generally, not to say it's uh, perfect yet because it's still struggling. I think Australia spends a lot more time thinking about the integration of the environment and water use. They have a much stronger sense of their river systems, even though their water also comes in many cases from a, a long way away, they have much more of a connection even to the bush that in, in the urban arena, they're smaller, there are fewer people, they're a big giant island. Um, so they think of themselves as um, more of a community. They expect there to be science, they expect there to be planning and government. Whereas, and I think we can learn a lot from them. I, I also think uh, they and the, uh, in, in this will be just a quick ad, they and most of the Western states have a more rationalized uh, water rights systems than we do in say California, where ours is kind of a mess mishmash of four oh, different so systems without being tr <laughs> trued up. Uh, where we have certain advantages is we have a public trust doctrine and a sure. constitutional provision against waste and reasonable use, which actually gives the water board, which is unusual in right. the 50 states because it does both water quality and water rights, the theoretical ability to actually protect our ecosystems that right. we all share. It's just right. implementation of it is difficult, both from a legal time consuming lack of staffing spec, uh, respect, but also the politics of it are so fraught. But in theory, in theory, we actually have a better <laughs> system for in melding the environment and water user um, concerns in an incredibly interesting way. I think um, Australia is a bit ahead of us on that. And not their, necessarily their modern water rights reforms in the 90s that led to trading, which are, you can argue pro and con, but their notion of leaving half of the river in the river and their notion of having a water rights system that's easier to implement than the one we have. So they're just different things that different countries are doing um, a little better. I will say that the, the notion of integrated water management where you're bringing all these things together in a water head, watershed. I mean, I think a lot of folks in California feel like, wow, we invented that 20 years ago with Prop 40 or whatever it was. Right. It's been around for 50 years in the yes. international <laughs> That's where in the international world, and this was a shock to me. I didn't know this still on my travels that, you know, people, I was listening to people from Africa, people from South Asia, people from South America all talk about their inner 
integrated water management schemes. And I felt like such a jerk because, of course, I thought, well, we must be cutting edge because we're California. It was like, no, kid, sorry. They called not. it IWRM versus IRWM for us. So it was uh, integrated water resource management. Oh, and I right. think so it's oh, a, the right. R and W right. are different. So, <laughs> but that has been around for a while. And I think yeah. that's, that is definitely. Um, that's a very important point with um, sort of um, that whole integration is so important and has been realized right as part of the same as I think the sustainability movement. Mm -hmm. It's it's part of that process that we have to realize this integration across the sector and across various sectors in order to achieve a better right. resilience and right. sustainability. Well, and your point about appreciating what you can see, I mean, and more in the right. in the more of the developed world, at least here, we have this, you know, history of manifest destiny and conquering nature in addition to being far away, you know, Europe is urban, but they have a much greater sense of uh, the importance of green space Absolutely. and community and rivers Absolutely. than we do. So I think we, we've got a, there are plenty of places we can look for inspiration. I agree. I agree. Uh, there's so many questions about uh, recycling and reuse and gray water. And I know you, that's, oh, that's an that issue. Bummer. Yes, that's an issue very close to your heart. And uh, um, I don't know if you want to share something a little bit about uh, recycling. We have about a minute, so maybe, yeah. maybe well, we just touch on that. <laughs> we're at an incredible inflection point and paradigm shift. I mean, this is one of the things I'm most proud of in, in working with local uh, communities during the drought, where we put a billion and a half dollars out in grants and loans to help get projects that have been on the drawing board in some cases for decades, I think about LA, um, and not actually implemented. And then in uh, streamlining our regulations, including for groundwater recharge and uh, agricultural use and uh, reservoir augmentation, I'm using the wrong words because they've changed them, but also direct potable rules, tight ones okay. in uh, 2023 that have given water agencies something to shoot at versus um, worrying about an individual permit writer and an individual regional board and a different uh, drinking water person, there's now something to aim at. And you are seeing not just Orange County Water District, which right now is the largest sure. water recycling groundwater augmentation project in the world, but you're seeing LA um, have a plan by 2035 to go to 100% recycling. You have uh, a Metropolitan proposing a project that's even bigger than Orange County mm -hmm. with agreements potentially as far away as Las Vegas and Arizona on wow. the Colorado because they know what they're aiming at. Right. And it's so exciting. And you have it happening in the Bay Area, you have um, sure, sure. at a different scale and you've got you know the innovations even in onsite treatment for large district scale, large uh, corporations like the Google work or mm -hmm. San Francisco where if you're building a building over a certain size, you gotta take care of your own waste. I mean. We're at a renaissance and an, a For vast sure. acceleration on recycling. And the public wants it. The drought helped with that. But the public's not as afraid of technology in this demographic era than uh, previous generations. So sure. that's all to the good. That's great. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate we ran out of time. There's a billion other questions to ask. And it's always a such a pleasure to uh, speaking to you. And I'm lucky to have you around at uh, uh, Stanford so we can continue on these conversations. But thank you so much for joining me. And thank you to thanks to Pacific Council to um, uh, facilitating and uh, enabling this uh, uh, conversation. Uh, and thank you to the audience who joined us today. It was uh, uh, thank you for all your questions. And uh, I think uh, uh, I would not speaking out of, out of turn to say that you can always reach out to Felicia and me if, uh, with any other questions you may have. And if you want to follow up on any of the issues that Felicia brings, definitely feel free to reach out to her. Thanks thank for you. the opportunity. Thanks for the great work. And thank you to Pacific Council for your ongoing interest in water issues. It's really been wonderful to work with you over the years. Absolutely.